Hi, this is Matthew Joby. Welcome to the Muse and Psyche podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing mindfulness meditation for performance anxiety. When discussing any concepts that come from the East as applied to Western psychology, and specifically here we're talking about Buddhist psychology, I think it's important to address some uh, common uh, thoughts, uh, perceptions, and misconceptions about um, what exactly uh, Buddhism is and Buddhist psychology is. For some individuals, Buddhism is in fact practiced as a religion. And for others, Buddhism is practiced as a life philosophy. And here in the West, perhaps the most recent uh, version of of Buddhism is uh, often practiced as a psychology. And the psychology is very similar to the life philosophy. In other words, these are guiding principles uh, on living, on how to make the most out of one's life, how to live deliberately, perhaps. And uh, I found over the years in music and psychology that uh, Buddhist principles are very effective in, in helping individuals to um, get to where they could be in, uh, in their art. So um, when we talk about Buddhism, uh, the first thing to I would like to point out, as I do in my classes when I teach the psychology of religion, is many individuals confuse Hinduism and Buddhism. And they're uh, very different things, although Buddhism is in many ways an outgrowth of Hinduism and the Vedic uh, religions. Uh, But Buddhism in itself has quite a few different varieties. For example, individuals might be very familiar with the Dalai Lama and Tibetan Buddhism, And Tibetan Buddhism has uh, characteristics that are very different from, say, Chinese and Japanese Zen Buddhism, Uh, whereas Tibetan Buddhism has culturally emerged as a combination between uh, Buddhism and shamanism. uh, The Zen Buddhism of China and later Japan, that's very popular amongst uh, the beat generation in here in America on the east and west coast, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and others. Uh, in Zen Buddhism, uh, this is really a, a, a fusion of Buddhism and Taoism. So sometimes folks become very confused because of different terms and uh, seemingly complex array of of ideas that exist in Buddhism, and I think it's probably useful to keep in mind that we're talking about a tradition that covers many different cultures and uh, covers many different languages, so many of the concepts in Buddhism are actually very uh, conducive to life philosophy and and to making music and being a performing and creative artist. Um, And I think it's important to use, um, at least in the introduction, use uh, easy-to-grasp, familiar ways of describing the ideas. So when you read books or you listen to lectures on Buddhist psychology or Buddhism in general, try not to get scared or turned off by the seemingly mysterious multiple terms for singular ideas in, in different languages. This is something that you just have to uh, become comfortable with, uh, understanding that we're talking about a very old tradition and a tradition that uh, covers many different cultures, many different languages, and has many different varieties. Largely, our variety of Buddhism is going to draw primarily on Zen Buddhism and also on Tibetan Buddhism. The two major influences that I draw from are Alan Watts and Chogyam Trungpa. And Alan Watts would be a a Western, uh, Sausalito, California version of Zen Buddhism. And uh, Chogyam Trungpa 
is a uh, was a, a Tibetan Buddhist monk who wrote extensively on Buddhist psychology. And as a matter of fact, Alan Watts and Chogyam Trungpa both wrote uh, texts devoted to uh, Buddhist psychology. Watts wrote Psychotherapy East and West. And Trungpa, who was the founder of Naropa University in Boulder, Boulder Colorado, uh, has also written m just many books on applying psychology, uh, Buddhism to psychology. I want to start with an idea of Trungpa's. When we are dealing as musicians with this thing we call performance anxiety, what is performance anxiety? Performance anxiety, uh, for those of you who are not musicians, this is what uh, sometimes people experience when they're faced with doing a math problem in their head or making change uh, when at a cash register, freezing up, becoming paralyzed, a, very, a task that one has practiced and performed uh, in their own private uh, studio or practice room, uh, suddenly a blank is drawn. It, it's as if we've never seen the material before. And we, this, uh, this transcends preparation or knowledge or ability. It's uh, something that takes us over. And uh, that's, a, that's what we mean by performance anxiety. Um, what we want to discuss here is how we can go about effectively countering this uh, reaction that many of us get, this freezing up in front of an audience, this uh, all of the physiological and emotional and psychological implications that come from uh, performing in front of others or playing in front of others or creating in front of others. I think that... Um, there are certain things that have been effective in uh, my own dealing with performance anxiety and helping others to deal with performance anxiety. And I I'd offer to you a starting point, as Trungpa does, um, with not completely understanding why or how something is working, but just making the first step towards uh, a new approach, towards a new experience in the phenomenon of playing and performing, making music in front of an audience. And what I'm going to offer to you is this one simple piece of advice as a starting point. And we won't get into the how or the why of this, the theory, but um, I would encourage you to take time each day, perhaps in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, maybe all three, for 10 minutes set a timer. There are many meditation timers on the, uh, on the apps, on your, on your smartphones, etc. Just a, a simple little uh, oven timer would work. Uh, for 10 minutes, I'd like you to set the timer, be in an isolated, quiet place, in sitting or laying in a position that is comfortable to you. Um, no special, there's no need for a special a sitting position or just sit in your, your chair. The most important thing is that you can just be uninterrupted for 10 minutes. Take this 10 minutes, close your eyes, and breathe normally. Don't even think about your breathing. Just breathe normally. Just be in the room and direct your thinking to this one concept. And I'd like you to repeat this concept over and over in your head. I will cease judging others, and I will cease judging myself. Now, you can use some variation on this. You can say, I will not judge others, I will not judge myself, or I will, no judgment, or no judgment of others, no judgment of myself. The important thing here is that you're addressing both the judgment of others and the judgment of one's own self. Now, what, what happens is this. For the first few mornings, maybe even the first week, this seems like just an exercise for 10 minutes of repeating a phrase, an idea. And I, I want you to really think to yourself what this means. Don't judge others and don't judge yourself. This means that a difference or a differentiation between judgment and observation. 
the ability to observe, observe others, observe their actions, their behaviors, their ways of being, observing our own actions, our own behaviors, our own way of being, is making note of, being aware of, without judging, without categorizing, without designating good, bad, right, wrong, true, false, etc. And we want to give ourselves a break from the judgment. This means you see someone that says something, does something, believes something, acts in some way that you find either favorable or unfavorable, tasteful or distasteful, something you agree with or disagree with, and not making a judgment, but just observing, saying, oh, isn't that interesting? In other words, an observation without judgment. Also with ourselves, when we uh, don't perform up to or play up to our, our desired peak performance, uh, when we don't, uh, when, when we fail in something we've dedicated ourselves to or, or we've missed our practice session or uh, even m maybe uh, tripped up on our diet, something like this, instead of reproaching ourselves, observe it. Make an observation, say, okay, I did not perform as well as I would have liked to. I didn't uh, practice as intently or as long as I wanted to, but not judging it, just letting it be what it is. Now, the idea here is giving up a sense of control. It's allowing things to just be. I promised that we weren't going to uh, get into too much theory here today, but I just want to add this little offering to you regarding judgment. In Buddhist psychology, one does not fight the symptom. In other words, through accepting what is, embracing the symptom, whether that's sadness or anxiety or anger at oneself or disappointment, accepting it and saying, what do I have to learn from this? One transforms the, the emotion into something that can be a great teacher, something that can, can show, this, show us the way, rather than being an obstacle. So I'd like you to just trust me on this. And uh, for this next week, take 10 minutes a day in solitude in a comfortable position and keep thinking, contemplating, chewing on. This is what we call meditating. Meditating on the intention to not judge others and not judge ourselves. I'm going to give you a little bit of neuroscience here at the end of this and tell you that the neuroscientists and neurosurgeons have described an incredible phenomenon for individuals who have had paralysis. It turns out that individuals who have had uh, strokes and paralysis can go for sometimes years without, without being able to move a certain side of the body, a left arm or a right arm, depending on where the stroke took place. But in some of these patients, uh, it's been useful to ask the individuals to intentionally try each day, try to move their arm with their mind, intend to move their arm with their mind, the paralyzed arm. And for some of these patients, it's been reported uh, that suddenly, after months, sometimes years of just intending to use the arm, suddenly they find themselves turning the, the radio station or brushing their teeth with the paralyzed hand or paralyzed arm. This is described in V.S. Ramachandran's uh, famous and, and great book. So what the parallel here is, the power of intention the power of intention is something that once we rehearse the idea, once we remind ourselves, we're forming a new habit. William James talked about uh, habits and how the self is a collection of habits. What we're doing here in this 10 minutes a day of mindful meditation on cessation of judgment is creating a new habitual way of looking at the world and at looking at ourselves. I'm going to uh, be eager to hear how you 
uh, find this first week has transformed not only your, your creative and performing life as, as an artist, as a music maker, uh, but also uh, your everyday life and interaction with others. Uh, feel free to contact me and tell me how uh, you found the meditation exercise.